the playlist party with your host, Roy Mayorga. Hello, everyone out there in internet world. I am Roy Mayorga. I am the drummer for Stone Sour and Ministry. In case you don't know, now you do. Um, today, I'm basically going to share a part two of a playlist that I started with a few months ago on this show. Uh, basically, it covered the first decade of my life of what of the music that influenced me and inspired me to become who I am today as a drummer, as a musician, as a composer. So today we're going to start from where I left off. I think where I left off last time was what song did I leave off on the police message in the bottle. Basically that year it was 79, 1980. That's, that was like the gateway to punk and Let's see, uh, a lot of underground music and soundtracks and films and stuff like that. And that really inspired me and, and started to, sh to shape me and made a lot of, made a big impact on me as a kid. So this is like, I'm probably like 10 years old, 1980. So the first thing that turned my head in the film world was obviously soundtracks. So I was really into soundtracks. And as we left off from before, you know, obviously I was into synthesizers I was into, you know, dark sounding, you know, tones like that. So when I heard this soundtrack, this score for the first time, it just had a huge, huge impact on me. And I was just like, this is incredible. I never heard anything like this. And then seeing this image with this music by this composer named Wendy Carlos, um, she used a uh, one of those old Moog modulars that we were talking about before. So kind of like what the stuff that I own, like she had like um, a, a, a DK Synergy, a Moog modular and a bunch of custom made stuff that she used on this uh, soundtrack. And it's in the movie that I'm talking about is The Shining. There it is. Wendy Carlos and Rachel Eklund. They, those two were actually partners for the longest time in creating music and over the you know through the 70s and 80s. I think they also worked together on Tron, if I'm not uh, if I'm not mistaken, which is right after this film. But this particular track here, I mean, that's what did it for me. And following up after and following up to that, um, or actually after that, that's when I started getting into into this guy. John Carpenter and his soundtrack. So that really just set the tone for me, like this track in particular. After that, I was into John Carpenter. I started following all his stuff, but let's, let's listen to this. It's pretty dark. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Now imagine hearing this in a theater <laughs> for the first time and listen and seeing that opening shot of that helicopter shot, you know, in the, in the, in, in Colorado, that Colorado scene with this in the background, it's just like, wow, blew my fucking mind. I was scared, but I liked it. <laughs>
funny. For the longest time, I thought this was Wendy Carlos' original music, but it's actually by, uh, I think it says Thomas of Solano. It's like, uh, it's, it's a cover. But her version, I mean, <laughs> it's just like next level. I mean, originally it was done with all orchestral instruments, but Wendy using a Moog modular just made it even more darker and just colder sounding and just more menacing and ominous. Let's see. How did you notice a soundtrack at 10 years old? Well, I mean, it was in your face. I mean, you, 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 there's no... There's no way of not noticing it or, or not paying attention to it because like that scene when it opens up, it's just so like it takes over you, you know, it's on a big 70 millimeter screen. It's in your face. The music is just loud and it's the subwoofers are just pumping all that low end and you, you feel it in the seats. I mean, it did something to me when I first heard it. Um, and like I said, I had a love for those dark tones just being into, you know, into the whole sound of synthesizers prior to that. You know, I never heard synthesizers used in this way. I've only heard them used in a way like say Kraftwerk was using them or the way Edgar Winter was using them, but I never heard anyone like use it like Wendy Carlos. So after I heard that, I started doing more research on Wendy Carlos and then I went and bought Switched on Bach, which came out about 10 years prior to, or 11 years prior to, uh, to, the Shining. I think that came out in 1968 or 69. And the Wendy Carlos switched on Bach album, that's primarily done all on Moog Modular, every bit of it. She played it all by hand, you know, probably like, you know, slowed some tape down to play, to play like those sequence patterns really fast and then sped it back up and then played on top of that. I mean, she overdubbed like on a 16 track, I think, or an A track to make that record. And I mean, that was a pretty monumental record as of its time then. So, Fast forward after uh, Wendy Carlos, then I started getting into John Carpenter because then, you know, I, I heard, I saw The Fog, which I, which came out before this film. So The Fog had a similar kind of morose kind of sound to it as well. So I was really into that sound. It was just a piano. And I think he's using like uh, one of those Oberheim Moog, uh, one of those Oberheim uh, SEM eight voice uh, key, uh, synthesizers. He was working with another composer guy named Dan Wyman at the time before he started working with Alan Howarth, which he worked with on this movie and Escape from New York. So I started following all of John Carpenter's stuff as well and started accumulating all the synthesizer music like that. And I started getting the Vangelis because of, you know, Blade Runner. So I started backtracking on all that. So that whole world is, you know, that opened because of Wendy Carlos, that whole world of soundtracks really opened up to me and I started noticing scores more. And, you know, even non-synthesizer uh, uh, compo scores like uh, Jerry Goldsmith. I mean, he Planet of the Apes, the first Planet of the Apes movie, like that's one of my favorite soundtracks. And that's, you know, stuff like that, you know. Anyway, now moving on to uh, after that, now let's get back to the drumming part of my life. So the first, band that I've listened to that used a lot of lots of like tribal drumming, which is mostly on toms, a lot of tom work, um, was by this band called Killing Joke. I don't know if any of you guys out there might have heard, might have not have heard of them. I'm sure you've heard of them. One of the best, one of the best bands to come out in that time, and they're still great, you know, to this day. Same original four members. Um, Paul Ferguson is the drummer of that band. Um, really heavy influence on me i can remember my brother you know came home with an album called what's this for it's their second album and uh that was produced by uh nick lane um the drums on that record it's just like i never heard anything like that it's like this big heavy room sound with you know obviously with the close mics on it so you, you have this room sound in the back uh, as a tail to these to the hits every time he really like lays into his drums it's it goes right through you i mean as a as an 11 year old now this is 1981 as an 11 year old i never heard drumming like this before either so that really 
caught my ear and I started, you know, playing to this record every day and just learning that style, you know, and really try to work that into what I want to, you know, what, what how I want to play later, you know. Um, there's this other live album that they put out after that called Ha. And there's a track on there called When the Pandies Come. And the studio version is great, but some about this live track, it's just got so much energy. And it's it's from 1982. It's like a year later. I think this is after, this is around the time they were touring for that album Revelations, which is a great album produced by Connie Plank uh, from Germany, who also produced Kraftwerk you know, through the 70s as well, as well a few times. Actually, I think he worked on the Autobahn record, if I'm not correct. If I'm not mistaken, but listen to this track. Drumming on this track is awesome. And this is live. The whole time. To who doesn't, the people who don't have this record, you gotta get this record. It's a 10 inch. It's it's great, all of it. But this is one of my favorite songs off that record. That weird sound you hear in the background, that's Jazz Coleman playing, uh, I think he's playing an Oberheim OBX. It's like, I think like the second synthesizer Ho Oberheim made after the SEM, after the Eight Boy series. Like that was Killing Joke's like background tone was that OBX. But on the records prior to this, like like on on uh, the What's This For album, you can really hear that synthesizer a lot throughout the tr throughout the music. It's got this crazy gnarly growl to it. It's like a psycho bagpipe, yeah. <laughs> Funny, I always thought he was try uh, jazz was trying to replicate um, that high sound you're talking about. I always thought jazz was trying to replicate like a like a Zorna or one of those uh, um, one of those uh, double reed instruments from the, from the Middle East. That's what kind of what it sounds like to me, which I which I love. I mean, even just listening to this band, it's got me into listening to world music and I've discovered like traditional Moroccan music because of music like this you know it's like I want to hear more of that and hear a more raw form and like because of this record and other people around me like I, I really got into this uh, record called uh, Master Musicians of Jajuka it's a group from Morocco and they play this music that's from like 3,000 4,000 years old and it's like eight to nine of them on stage where they all play gimbris and they, some of them play the, the tabla drums and some of those zurnas, like that sound that you're hearing right now. And it sounds incredible. Um, it's an album, yeah, the album's called Masters, Master Musicians of Jujuka. It's on Axiom Records. Bill Laswell, um, one of the, the leader of the band Material, who also Mike Beinhorn was a part of, he produced this record. So I suggest getting that record. Yeah, I probably should have added that to the playlist, but you already heard it from me. So when you want, go check it out. All right. What do I got next? Well, 
Okay, so continuing on to on to hardcore punk. So in 19, this came out in 1982, but I didn't discover the Bad Brains until like a few years later. But by about 84, 85, that's probably the, my time when I really started diving into the faster stuff. Like got into Dead Kennedys and Black Flag and stuff like that. And I discovered this band through a friend of mine. And I heard this, uh, this track, and I was like, fuck, this is so fast. I never heard anything this fast. And this wanted me to play fast. So I, this inspired me to want to play double time. I mean, I mean, I, I thought Discharge and Motorhead were fast and GBH was fast. But when I heard this, <laughs> check it out. Nothing like the Bad Brains. They're the best, hands down, one of the best hardcore bands ever. Hard to beat. <laughs> From Washington, D.C. And you want to see this, what these guys are like live? You should all watch Live at CB's 1982. It's on YouTube. That's probably the best representation of this band for me. Because when I first heard and seen that, footage it was like you gotta be joking i mean i saw them years later after that i saw them when they had the eye against eye album out and it was still great but this is like a whole other level man <laughs> hr was on fire um doing backflips somersaults and just landing on on his feet right on time right on the downbeat <laughs> at this at this speed and his brother earl hudson on drums like mind blowing. Yes, hardcore at its best, man. And from from getting into Bad Brains, I mean that opened up a whole door as well to a, a, you know to more hardcore. I got into Agnostic Front. Um, I got into Reagan Youth. I got into Chromags, you know, stuff like that. I mean, those bands had a big influence on me as, as a teenager. Um, who else? Adrenaline OD, you know, Circle Jerks, DRI, COC. I saw all these bands in the mid 80s. It was it was the best, it was the best time for, for punk, man. I mean, it was so underground and it was so word of mouth. And you found out about I mean, I found out about a lot of these shows that I went to just through going to record stores or through people and stuff like that, you know, on street. Cause I wasn't living in New York yet. Like in the mid eighties, I was still living in Pennsylvania. You know, after my parents got divorced, we moved to Pennsylvania. Uh, so I was living in a place called Allentown, Pennsylvania, while all this was going on. And I would venture out to Philly to see shows. I would venture out to New York to see shows, but I would also stay and see shows in Allentown in the Lehigh Valley area. There's this place called West Caddy Playground. It was in this. It was in a. It was in a. In another part of Allentown, like another suburb. Well, it's all suburbs, but another part outside of, of Allentown in the Lehigh Valley community, Lehigh Valley area, uh, in a place called Catasauqua. And they used to have this little recreation uh, uh, hall in the middle of this playground. And um, the, these guys, uh, Scott Andrews, from from a band called Russian Meat Squats, who lived in Northampton. Pennsylvania used to put on shows there and he would have bands like uh, uh, DRI and COC and, and UK subs. He would book all these bands. So that was my way of getting to see all this stuff and being exposed to it. I saw Black Flag for the first time through because of this. I saw Dead Kennedys you know, during that time, like uh, during their uh, Frankenchrist record or something like that. That was, those are really important times, man. It was awesome. It was a great time. I started, I got into bands, you know, I was in a band called Youthquake around that time, you know, and just you know that's we just met each other and got together because of these shows you know so it was a really special time for me you know so when i hear bands like bad brains i hear dead kennedys i'll hear crucifix i remember all this stuff you know and that pretty much started my path to become a performer and you know, to become a touring guy you know and just, just get in the van and start you know playing you know so and after that, you know, obviously started listening to more metal because I was around, you know, there's 
my friends were into my friends were also into bands like Celtic Frost and you know Metallica at the time and they I think at that time it was just Right of Lightning was was just just came out and um I gotta admit I didn't give it a chance at first because I was kind of like I don't know Metallica da, da, da. and then I put the record on Fire Fire of Fire was the first song I was like okay I'm in and then after that that opened the door to Slayer to Exodus Celtic Frost Venom so I had all that I was in that's that was my introduction to metal but of all those bands and all those records the one record that really turned my head and made me want to play double bass and borrow that second kick drum from my friend was Slayer and it was this song I think that pretty much did it for every drummer at this time hit it I'm not even going to talk. Just listen. I don't need to say much about this because everybody knows how badass this track is. Here we go. I was 16 when I first heard this. And my best friend in high school gave me the cassette. Fire. All of them. I think that's Jeff Hanneman. Kerry King. 
Yeah, it's Kerry King. Jeff. I always thought that was so cool. The trade off on the Stolos here. Kerry. Here comes the classic part. When I first heard that, <laughs> I think when every drummer first heard that, pretty much shit their pants. <laughs> I gotta say this though that record i mean just the sound and tonality of that record alone the mix the production i mean it's rick rubin production but it was mixed by andy wallace i mean that guy got the in my opinion got the best drum sound and performance out of people i mean you could hear it all to all three of those slayer records the, this this one uh, rain and blood south of heaven and uh, Season of the Abyss, and then anything he's done after that, like that drum sound, you just knew how to, the, he had the best kick drum sound in the business, as it's been said, and and I agree 100%. I mean, he, all his records sound great. His Nirvana Nevermind sounds great. The drums on that sounds killer. Uh, I think he did a Jane's Addiction album, uh, and then that, the um, the drum sound and mix on, on, on uh, Jeff Buckley's Grace. I mean, they all... They all have a sound. They all—it's really raw and punchy. It's got a bit of got a bit of that mid-range, but it's got some beef underneath it, and with a little bit of a, a reverb tail, just very faint. And you can hear that on this Slayer record. And I just love the sound of it, and the, the way the guitars just sit on the drums with the vocals—it's it's like the perfect mix, you know. It's it's the perfect record. I think that record's like 33 minutes. This this album—it's 33 minutes of just pummeling you know what i mean um but yeah dave's drumming on this whole record it's i mean what can i say but it is nothing more than perfect um it has groove it has there's a lot of push a lot of pull in it and it's it's just right you know um yeah he's definitely one of the heavily he's, he's very he's influenced a lot of drummers man me included and everyone else and uh over the years you know, I got to uh, got to know him really well, and I could say call him my friend, and he's a really good guy, um, great drummer, still kicks ass, it's amazing. If you want to see him, go see him when Mr. Bungle comes back out. You got to check Dave. Dave's the best. Love you, Dave. <laughs> All right. Um, what's next? Okay, so this band. This is how you pronounce it. This is a German band from Berlin. They're called Einstrutzende Neubauten. This album came out in 1985. So while listening and going to punk shows and playing in punk bands, I really got into another um, scene of music, which was labeled industrial. And that in that phrase and that that phrase was coined by uh, Genesis Piorage, one of the members of Throbbing Gristle, because he was briefly asked. How would you explain Throbbing Gristle? And he just pretty much turned to the interviewer and said, well, industrial. And then that's how industrial music, you know, title pretty much began. Um, but from what I'm hearing, Neubauten never really considered themselves that. They considered themselves, you know, a lot different than that. But I considered them that because, I mean, they're, let's face it, they're using, they're using, you know, metal parts of metal from junkyards they would go to from town to town when they would perform and literally do junk runs like when they first came to america from what i heard they didn't bring any of their stuff they might have brought a couple of pieces of gear that was important that they use all the time but most of the stuff that they had on stage with them in, in america from what i heard they would go to junkyards in whatever city they were at and find whatever they can get and bring that to the stage and perform their show and um, this is a this is this song is called uh, 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 no that's not sensucked that's the wrong song <laughs> actually it's the wrong song but the song I wanted to play you is called Yugung uh, 
feed my ego. But I mean, we could play this, but it's not the song that I wanted. <laughs> um, can we fix that? Can we fix that? This is the link. Uh, okay. We're listening to it. Ah, actually, this is all right. I'm glad you're playing this because this is, this is give you an idea what they were like live. And this is something, I think this is something that they, this is a live video that they filmed to represent this record. This is only one of the songs off the record. That's that thing that you see that guy hitting. That's the one thing that they would take with them everywhere. But all this other stuff you see around them, that's all stuff they just gathered that day, probably. <laughs> and just put it together. It's not for everybody. I love this band. I was lucky to see these guys a few times. Probably one of the loudest shows I've ever been to. Definitely dangerous. Because uh, they used to set the stage on fire. Not, I mean, not any of the shows I've been to, but they have done stuff like that. This guy here that's banging on on the, on the sheet metal with the, with the, the funny hair. He, this guy here, he's do all kinds of crazy stuff on stage, like throw pieces of the metal into the crowd, shopping carts. Like he, this guy would go mental on stage, and you just have to just beware. <laughs> but they put on a great show, man. And I think from listening to these guys all the time back then is what inspired me to use most of the China crashes and weird little um, China symbols all over my drum kit because I used to love the sound of what they had. Just so I wanted that everywhere around my kit with different sizes so that you get different tones, like some higher pitch, some lower pitch, so I can have that element that they had. And that's why I use so many Chinas on my kit. I always had people ask me, why is your kit mostly China crashes? This is why. This band. Also, while listening to this band at the, at the time, um, in New York, there was another band that was also labeled as industrial um, or no wave or whatnot. I consider more no wave than industrial. A band called Swans. I don't know if anyone ever heard of them. I used to really be into them. Of course, Sonic Youth this is before, you know, Goo and all that stuff. This is when Sonic Youth had an album out called like Bad Moon Rising, Evil. The Swans at the time had records out like uh, um, Young God and uh, Time is Money and stuff like that. Um, Children of God, which is actually my favorite Swans record. I think people out there need to check out this band. Pick that record up. Children of God. It's a double album. Uh, Ted Parsons from Prong was a drummer of this band at that time. Swans had many different lineups, but it always consisted of Michael Gira and... Um, Norman Westbrook, those two have always been in the band, but they always had different bass players, different drummers. But this lineup of Children of God, in my, my personal opinion, is I think one of the best and one of my favorite lineups. Um, I was lucky to see them at this time. Um, I think Al Kizzy was playing bass. Jarbo, Michael Gira's then girlfriend, was playing keys. And Ted Parsons on drums, Norman Westberg on guitar. I think they had another another drummer too with Ted Parsons. I can't remember his last name, his, his first his name right now at the moment. I think it's something 
Gonzalez, something like that. But there was two drummers, and I saw this, and <laughs> it was probably one of the heaviest shows I've ever seen. Um, and it, it's on a whole different level. I suggest going to uh, check these guys out. Well, I was also really into um, other new wave bands. I was really into Lydia Lunch. I was into uh, uh, Fetus, Scraping Fetus. <laughs> Uh, that's Jim Thurwell, who's uh, he's actually from Australia, but he, he lived in New, he lived in New York this, from the '80s on to now, and uh, he was a basically one man band, and uh, he's a composer in, at, at the moment. Uh, he uh, yeah, go check them out as well. Scraping fetus. <laughs> um, what else we got? What's next? That was it. I thought I had more. <laughs> well, anyway, that was basically the soundtrack to my life in the 80s. That's what I was listening to. And that's what pretty much inspired me. That's a nice pocket of what's in here. <laughs> yeah, absolute madness. OK. If you want to find me, you want to chat more about it, uh, you can hit me up on Instagram at, uh, yeah, there you go, or my Facebook page, and there you go. And, uh, yeah, I'm here. You're there. And I'll catch you later. Thanks for listening.